In this video, we'll examine nine core principles of site reliability engineering and the implementation of a DevOps approach to building and maintaining your organization. Now, this will typically begin by ensuring that you have the right personnel, which does primarily involve bringing in coders. But that said, the term coder in this context does not necessarily mean purely application developers. For example, someone who is adept at writing automation scripts to handle tasks such as applying updates would certainly qualify as a coder. But in many cases, this is the point, implementing automation so that the amount of manual administration is reduced as much as possible so you don't have to address management issues by just adding more people. So one way or another, the primary responsibility of the SRE will be writing code. The second principle then is to build a team of site reliability engineers that can draw from a pool of developers and to treat them as developers in an ongoing manner. But again, the context here is not just building applications. The SRE is a developer. It's just that the focus is a little broader so that those who might have considered themselves to be only developers in the past are now contributing to the reliability of the system overall, not just focusing on its functionality. And of course, this is where someone who may have been only an administrator in the past may come into the picture as well. By bringing in their own expertise in perhaps fault-tolerant storage or large cluster management, they are also helping to develop a more comprehensive solution. The third principle then can be thought of as recognizing the core capabilities of your development team. And again, the idea behind being an SRE is to bridge the gap between development and operations, not to completely merge the two. In other words, don't try to offload all operations on developers. Let them do what they do, but keep the ops work to a minimum. Likewise, don't ask your administrators to start developing applications. But the key is to recognize the separate skill sets while encouraging at least some degree of overlap. Similar to the third principle, the fourth also deals with recognizing core capabilities and ensuring that SREs also do not have to stray too far beyond their skill set by capping their operational load at around 50% or perhaps even a little lower to maybe around 30, meaning that the focus of the SRE should be on improving reliability through automation not developing new features of an application, for example. That's the job of developers. Now, one way to approach this is to try to determine how long, on average, any given issue takes to address and limit the number of issues accordingly. For example, if it takes four hours overall to deal with an issue, which, by the way, should include documentation and or review, then in a standard eight-hour shift, one SRE can only handle two issues at a time. The fifth principle effectively deals with ensuring adequate staffing levels. Now, clearly this will depend on the structure of your organization and how often issues tend to arise and how long those issues generally take to address. But if we just use some arbitrary values here for an on-call team of, let's say, eight engineers, and if there is, again, on average, two events per shift per person, then this results in a maximum of 16 events that can be effectively handled. So if in your organization you are consistently encountering more than this, then you will very quickly start to burn out your staff and ultimately be unable to keep up with the demand. The sixth principle is to create and maintain an approach whereby blame is not directed at people. Obviously, people can make mistakes, but the focus should be that the problem lies within the system the process, the environment, or the technology stack itself. Perhaps more simply stated, try to avoid pointing fingers. Focus on how to correct the problem and how to improve things moving forward so that the same issue does not continue to arise again and again. Of course, there will always be issues, but the ultimate goal of an SRE really should try to be to come as close as possible to automating themselves out of a job. The seventh principle essentially deals with communication, written service level objectives, which can be used as baselines against which actual performance values will be measured. 
along with an agreed-upon service level agreement, which outlines the level of performance a provider can offer and that a customer finds to be satisfactory, and service level indicators, which generally take the form of dashboards or charts that can display actual measured values and or generate alerts in the event that an indicator falls below a stated objective. To put all of this into plain English, it would basically equate to something along the lines of don't make promises you can't keep. Toward that end, the eighth principle is to ensure that you don't exceed the service level objective, which in this context means that you should favor stability and reliability over constant growth and change. Clearly, new features should be introduced to keep your system as up-to-date as possible, but this should not be the focus. Piling in new features into a system that cannot handle them will only cause more problems than they might be designed to correct. So, the service level objective should be treated similar to a budget if and or when new resources become available, such as through maybe upgraded hardware, then new features can be added at that time. But doing so prematurely will almost certainly backfire if taken too far. Finally, the ninth principle comes down to diligence, practice, and testing. And then to document those tests, then repeat, repeat, repeat. In other words, even if you were successful in creating a very resilient system that requires minimal intervention or administration, anything can still go wrong at any time. So you need to ensure that you can address those issues if and or when they happen. If, for example, you created an application that stayed online successfully for, let's say, two years, if it did fail after all of that time, would you still remember everything that needed to be done to correct it? So simulated failures and or manual failovers in a lab environment can be critical to ensuring that your troubleshooting skills remain sharp. Failures will still happen at some point, so you always need to remain on alert and remain familiar enough with the system to ensure that you can appropriately address those failures in a timely manner.